Welcome to the Self-Insurance Podcast brought to you by CRMBC. Every week, we're interviewing industry experts, restaurant operators, and brokers to talk about the world of workers' comp self-insurance in California. Today, it's my pleasure to welcome Amanda Rodriguez, attorney and a partner at Cooper Brown. Welcome, Amanda. Thank you so much for having me this morning. Amanda, tell us a little bit about yourself. What law school did you go to and how in the world did you decide to be a workers' comp litigator? Sure. It was a wild ride to get here. I'm a Los Angeles native. I went to Loyola Law School here in downtown LA. Uh, Comp was not my first journey. I was actually first interested in criminal law, but I started off as a new attorney at a work comp firm. I was introduced to it by a family friend and here we are almost 12 years later. Love it. I'm an attorney also and so I can say, how in the world did you? Because I did the same thing, <laughs> ended up in commercial real estate to start. And now I'm CEO of an insurance company. So yes. you started out in work comp and then you decided to stay though. So clearly there's something about it that you enjoy. I do. I do very much enjoy it. I love the balance of the litigation with also the medical component of it. Never did I see myself this involved with medical terminology and evaluations and assessment, but it's fascinating and I learn something every day. Um, and I just am a natural litigator. I love being in the courtroom. I love defending cases. It's, it was what I was born to do naturally. I love that. And yeah. obviously workers' compensation is about <laughs> helping the injured worker. So we don't want things to get litigated. We want to just take care of the injured worker and get them you know, taken care of and and back to work. But the reality is a lot of times these cases get litigated for a variety of reasons. So let's start just high level. Give me the the ballpark or the the universe of why does a workers' comp case get litigated? Usually it's kind of the most obvious answer that an injured worker retains counsel right away, whether it's because they've had friends who have done it, co-workers that have done it, they've heard about the system or they themselves feel lost in the system and will help navigating it. Um, so that could be true for what ends up being a denied case or even an accepted injury that is initially accepted by the insured, uh, but they end up litigating and retaining an attorney anyways. And so some of that is within some of the control of the uh, member that maybe they're not communicating clearly enough. Maybe they didn't speak to the employer right out of the gate and then the em- or the employee and the employee got scared and hired an attorney. But some of it is just out of the control of the employer. What, given your experience in this, what do you wish employers were doing that would make it easier to defend them when these claims get litigated? I would say once they're litigated, the best thing to do is document, document, document. I say that all the time to my clients. That's the best thing that the employer can do to protect themselves. But also once there is an attorney representing the employer or the insured, that's the best thing for us as well as the defense attorney. Being provided documentation, not just a verbal conversation that was had with the injured worker, but it's being memorialized in some way. The personnel file is well documented. That's one of the best things that can be provided to me as soon as I'm put on a claim to defend it or to help just the general litigation of it. Now, when you say document, people hear a million different things because when they're busy running their restaurant, they might think that they documented it, but then it gets to you and you're like, I can't use this. Be specific. Give me some specifics about what you wish that they would document and how you wish they would document it. Sure. So uh, I could use a write-up, for example, uh, having a specific write-up form that can be used. And whether it's a verbal conversation that was had quickly in passing, but is somehow memorialized in an email directed to the personnel file for that individual. It doesn't need to be lengthy. It doesn't need to be anything even necessarily formalized on a formal document or something that looks legal per se. It really just is a matter of getting it down so that it's fresh, relevant to that issue that took place in that moment. Um, And that's the best thing because oftentimes things happen and cases get litigated six months, eight months, a year later. And that information just isn't as fresh in that individual or that supervisor's mind when now I'm asking for that information. Yes, yes. I see that all the time. Mm -hmm. You mentioned earlier that one of the reasons why a case would get litigated is because someone has heard their friend went and litigated and so now they're doing it. And we actually had a situation a couple of years ago at CRNBC where there was a a turnover in ownership Mm -hmm. and on one single day, they had 30 work Mm -hmm. claims filed in one day. So you must see it, the whole gamut of people gaming the system. Mm -hmm. And especially in LA area, we see it very heavy. Why is it so prevalent in that area? 
in terms of litigating system. like that or, or like gaming the system. Yeah, gaming. You know, it, it, it's just I think part of it is that the L.A. area, the workers' compensation boards tend to be much, much more liberal than, for example, Northern California. So the practice is very different. So Cal to NorCal. And I do think that that naturally lends itself to more litigation in general. I mean, you see advertisements for you know attorneys all over the freeway. So it's very easy to get in touch with an attorney and file a claim. I've had cases, as you just described, where even where there wasn't a change in manage, management or a layoff, mass layoff or anything like that. But I've had where I've had groupings of cases. I had one in, that I can think of in particular that was five different injured workers that all filed claims within a week of each other with the same applicants council. There's no coincidence about that. They were grieved, uh, you know, they had grievances really about the same thing. And you could see how that happened. But you do see it often. And I think it's just a matter of uh, the demographic that you see in Los Angeles and the fact that it, the comp system is just much more liberal down. Now, that's interesting because I hear a lot of different reasoning behind that. And that's the first time I'd heard that. So thank you for that perspective. And it's something that we're looking at all the time and how we can combat that on the employer side and on the carrier side. Now, we're a self-insured group. So we encourage our members to get very involved in the litigation. Where do you see a lot of members getting involved and, and participating and going to depositions or do you wish that they would do that more or, or less? I, I think it's great when they do. I have several clients where the insurance are very involved. I think it's for me as the attorney, it provides a direct connection and pipeline to get information again to the source of the situation, the injury, the witnesses, employer witnesses. It's a great way to have direct access to that information. It also, I think, involves uh, has when the employer is more involved as well, especially at a deposition, that can really change the trajectory of the claim um, more on the fraudulent side and, and really in a retaliatory type claim. At a deposition, having the employer, whether it's a supervisor, an employer witness present can really have impact on the injured worker testifying and whether they actually want to go through with this case. So I, I, I love it personally as a defense attorney. I think it's great when the insured's involved. And it also often gives me a different perspective on the case and what's going on at the site of employment that I wouldn't necessarily have otherwise. Makes sense. And so when you are litigating these claims, there's a certain percentage that is fraud. There's a certain percentage that there's just a disagreement about what the amount should be. How much, and I, I'm not going to hold you to the number, but like roughly what percentage of these are fraud? Ooh, well, I'm going to say, and I'm going to use as a legal, the attorney in me wants to say like the little F fraud and the big F fraud. You know, I would say it really depends on the type of employment and employer you're dealing with so the different accounts. Some I would say are maybe 50-50 where you have a lot of legitimate injuries just because of the nature of the work that they're doing. It's more arduous or it's more dangerous in, by nature. So you're going to have a lot more legitimate claims. And I would say what I'm seeing a lot, you brought up the restaurant industry before, what I'm seeing a lot there is a lot more fraud, if you will, or red claims that have a lot of red flags because they're retaliatory in nature. They're short staffed, uh, or excuse me, their their business was slow during COVID. They laid off people. Now you have all these you know claims that are filed in response to that. Um, so I do really think it depends on the type of employer and account that you're working on. Um, but I would say, especially like I said in Southern California, the figure is high for claims that are more fraudulent in nature. What are, you mentioned the red flags. What are some of the red flags that you see that tell you that this is probably a small fraud? Sure. So a CT claim filed on a very short-term employee, or um, I have a case currently where the specific injury was alleged to happen within the first hour of employment, or where you have, you know, they've loved their employment. They've loved working with the insured. There may be a long-term employee. One thing happens and now they're filing a site case claim, but they've loved working there this entire time. So what could really be the issue? So those are some things that initially come to mind that I see that are immediate red flags with the litigated claim. For anyone listening that's not familiar with our terminology, what is a CP claim? Yes, a continuous trauma injury. <laughs> and what is, explain that a little bit for people. So it's, it's an injury, if you will, that spends more uh, over time. It can happen over an extended period of time. That could be hours and a day. 
um, or it could be months or years. So rather than a specific incident that takes place, like a slip and fall or a motor vehicle accident, it's more of something that happens due to the just um, use of a body part repetitively for a job duty. A lot of times you see like carpal tunnel cases like that, continuous trauma back injuries where the injured worker does a lot of lifting, repetitive lifting, unloading and loading. Um, so those are the types of claims that you see. And they're very prevalent in California. California comp is driven by the continuous trauma injury filing. Yeah. So cameras in the restaurants, having, you know, documentation. Give me some best practices that you wish, you already told me about documentation, but what are some of the things that you wish that, now I'm talking about restaurant owners because that's who our audience is. So we can talk just about that. What do you wish that they had done that would have helped you defend them better? Sure. Cameras is a great um, example because you can't really deny video coverage of something or, you know, a video of an incident that took place. Even if it establishes that the incident in fact took place, whether it's a slip and fall or let's say on a psych case, an argument between two coworkers, but it might give better insight as to how it actually took place. It might not be as severe or egregious as the injured worker claims, or it may confirm exactly what they're saying, right? And that's also really helpful, especially when they're evaluated by a medical examiner. You can send that video along and they can really see just how, you know, an incident took place. So cameras is a great example. I love to do, you know, if you can obtain written witness statements as well. I mean, that kind of goes to the documentation portion, but getting written witness statements, again, right as something has taken place, because that's the best time to capture that information. So anything that really solidifies the facts, if you will, one way or another, either disproves them or proves them, that's really helpful. Yeah, yeah, that, that makes sense. Do you, how often are you using private investigators in litigation? A lot more in the last three to four years, I will say. I use investigators to conduct anything from just background checks to getting information relative to prior medical treatment, prior claims that they might have had, to also the other end of the spectrum of action surveillance, sabros on an injured worker. That can also be really key to cases that are actually fraud, where they're claiming they're receiving temporary total disability benefits, but maybe they are in fact working. And so, yes, surveillance has been a huge part of my practice on cases that are denied in the last three to four years. They don't even have to be used on what you would consider high exposure cases. It could just be a run of the mill injury that's taken place. But again, there are red flags or things that come up that warrant the recommendation for surveillance. And is it the uptick in the last three to four years directly related to COVID? I think our industry is busier than ever, personally. I don't know if that is a direct result of COVID, but there are definitely patterns I have seen, whether it's with the types of cases filed that I think do have to do with COVID. I have seen more pure psych and stress cases and stroke cases in the last couple of years than I ever have before. And I do think that is a result of COVID. And so, so yes, I, I think that's a huge uptick. And surveillance, you know, in 2020, 2021, even beginnings of 2022 probably weren't going to produce a lot because people weren't really out and about, right? Now people are out and about, they're living their life again. And if anything, the surveillance has been phenomenal because of it, because they've kind of forgotten that they filed this claim a year or two ago. And even though they're in the process of litigating it, they're back to living their life. And so it has produced great results in my experience. Interesting. Yeah. You have a success story or a, or a horror story, whatever, without breaking confidentiality. Tell us something that just really was a cool story to share of something that you were able to accomplish as a defense attorney. You know, success is defined in many ways, <laughs> especially as a defense attorney. You can have success in resolving a case and you say that that was denied and there were issues regarding compensability and you had great success by resolving the case. And it's successful because you've mitigated litigation costs for your client, right? So that's one version of success. I would say that I had a successful case during, I think it was 2021. It was a COVID death claim and very sad. And, and we came, the parties really worked together to conduct that discovery very amicably and really work to both ensure that the employer was protected. I did my job in that regard and mitigated litigation costs while also achieving an excellent settlement amount for them. But it also expedited the process by getting the widow and the injured worker's family their benefits 
quicker, in a much quicker way as well. And so we didn't drag this out for three, four years, as oftentimes happens in cases like that. We came to a resolution, yeah, I think it was six or eight months in, which is pretty short on a case like that. And I think it was it was a great result for both parties. So I, I was proud with how that was handled with people. We have had, unfortunately, a couple situations. I've, I've been with this group 12 years, but uh, the group's been around for over 20 years. There's been a couple situations where there was collusion among mm-hmm. different practitioners to kind of hike up the cost and hike up the, the, the damage amount, if you will. Is that really prevalent? Are you seeing that still? I don't think it's as bad as it was, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, where a lot of those uh, doctors and medical facilities and hospitals have now subsequently been indicted or their medical licenses pulled. Uh, I don't think it's as egregious as it was happening. I do think that you certainly still see lean treaters or, or medical providers that are providing treatment on the lean basis because the case is denied, where there's still certainly, in my opinion, an egregious amount of treatment an egregious amount of uh, prescription medications. Like I, I would hope when I see some of these bills that these injured workers aren't actually taking all of that medication. I can't imagine the damage that that's doing. So I certainly think that there's still a fair amount of that going on. And, you know, as a defense attorney, you know, on an accepted case, you have typically an MPN and you have much more control of the medical treatment, right? On a denied case, you're still working to, from my perspective, then that triggers me to want to work to resolve the case Quicker, so we're mi- mitigating how much cost we're going to have on the back end with those lean providers that have provided excessive care. So I do see still some of it. I just don't think it's quite as prevalent as it was. Excellent. So final question. <clears throat> what are the hottest topics that you're seeing in work comp litigation right now? Yeah, I think the hottest topics or kind of point of a contention, if you will, between parties is the panel QME process. So the obtaining a neutral evaluator, if you will, the process of selecting a panel who beats who to the specialty request has become a game, if you will, between the parties. It used to be a, you'd requested off a denial letter and it you know, sometimes parties would wait two, three months after denial. Now people are using the delay letter for a claim to, you know, request a panel QME. And like I said, it's become a game. You know, applicants, attorneys typically want doctor specialties that are going to drive up the impairment, if you will, on a keep. So a chiropractor or a pain management specialist. And on the defense side, we don't want that. We want a more, if you will, legitimate physician to uh, evaluate the applicant or the injured worker. And so you're looking for an orthopedic. But that has been one of the game changers in the litigation field in the last few years of how that's become highly litigated too. just the issue. Oh, interesting. Amanda, thank you so much for joining me today. This was very enlightening. And it's the, the really great thing about this podcast is it's a place for our members and our brokers to come and learn about all these different specific topics. And you really shared some great information about the litigation side of it that members just might not be aware of. So I appreciate you. I appreciate your time today. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. Anytime that we can talk and share, you know, one one perspective over another in this field is great. It's ever changing. So the opinions and, and, and factors are always changing. Thank you so much. So, thank you. Thank you for joining us for the Self-Insurance Podcast brought to you by CRNBC. If there's a topic you'd like to learn more about or if you have any questions, just email us at info at crnbc.com. Remember to subscribe, like, comment, and share and join us again next week for more tips on self-insurance.